Good afternoon. Today, we're going to talk about the Hemophilia Guidelines for All, which is a new ambition of the World Federation of Hemophilia. I will be talking about Chapter 8, which is the guidelines for the management of hemophilia and inhibitors. My name is Dr. Margaret Ragney. I'm at the University of Pittsburgh and Hemophilia Center of Western Pennsylvania in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And here are my disclosures. I would like to thank my authors, including Eric Berntorp, Manuel Carcao, Carmen Eddingshausen, Augustus Nedzinkis, Margaret Ozalo, Enrique Hernandez, Andrew Salvaggi, Marika Vandenberg, Glenn Pierce, and Alok Srivastava. So inhibitors in hemophilia are IgG allo antibodies to exogenous clotting factor eight or nine that neutralize the function of infused clotting factor concentrates. Inhibitors are detected and quantified by the Nijmagen modified Bethesda assay and inhibitors are encountered in patients who have severe disease, more commonly in hemophilia A than hemophilia B, and are associated with a higher disease burden. This disease burden includes more serious bleeding and more serious bleeding complications, more allergic reactions, a higher rate of hospitalization, greater treatment costs, and higher mortality rate than in those without inhibitors. So the guidelines are focusing on what's new. These include the bleeding management, inhibitor screening, immune tolerance induction, which is abbreviated ITI, surgery and invasive procedures, and product switching. We're going to talk about these guidelines with several cases. Clinical case one. An 11 month old male with severe hemophilia A develops a large gluteal hematoma and small scattered hematomas over the last week. He has been on an on-demand recombinant factor eight uh, treatment plan for a target right knee bleed, but it is poorly responsive to his usual factor eight. There's no family history of inhibitors, but a three-year-old cousin who also has severe hemophilia A. At the Hemophilia Treatment Center visit, lab tests are drawn and reveal a hemoglobin of 11 grams per deciliter, factor rate less than 0.01 international units per ml, and an anti-factor rate of 12 Bethesda units. His family asks how to treat his bleeds now that he has an inhibitor, and they also want to know if the cousin should be tested for inhibitors. So let's look at the guidance. What is the management of bleeding for inhibitor patients? Well, it's important to recognize treatment is based on inhibitor type. That is low responding LR, which is less than five Bethesda units or high responding HR, which is greater than five Bethesda units. So the guidance states for patients with hemophilia A and factor eight inhibitors who develop an acute bleed the WFH recommends that treatment be based on whether the inhibitor is low or high responding. And as you can see here, for high responding inhibitors, management of bleeding includes recombinant 7A or active prothrombin complex concentrates. As you can see, by contrast, those with low responding inhibitors are treated with factor VIII. What about the management for hemophilia B bleeding? So treatment is based, again, on inhibitor type, low versus high responding. What's important in hemophilia B is to watch for allergic reactions. For patients with hemophilia B who develop anaphylaxis to factor IX therapy, the WFH recommends screening for an inhibitor because an allergic reaction may be the very first sign of inhibitor development. For patients with hemophilia B and high responding factor IX inhibitors, WFH prefers recombinant factor VII over activated prothrombin complex concentrates, which is APCC, to treat acute bleeds because APCC contains factor IX and may cause or worsen an allergic reaction. So that's it shown below in the table 
for on the right, high responding inhibitors, 7A or APCC is preferred. What about inhibitor screening? We have a cousin who has never been screened before. So it's critical to recognize that screening should occur after initial factor exposure and at least every six to 12 months then annually as we standardly do in our hemophilia treatment centers. Other times that inhibitor screening may occur include after intensive factor exposure, that is over five days, for recurrent bleeds or target joint bleeds that occur despite adequate treatment, for failure to respond to adequate treatment, for lower factor recovery than expected, or for suboptimal clinical or lab response to replacement therapy. It is also done before surgery and for any suboptimal postoperative response. So let's go to clinical case two. The patient's bleed resolves with recombinant factor 7A and you introduce the concept of ITI, that is immune tolerance induction with the parents. They ask what is the most effective approach to rid the inhibitor? They wanna know if a port is required. They recently attended the inhibitor summit and met several families who had had a good experience with emicizumab, also known as Hemlibra. That's the bispecific monoclonal antibody uh, that is a factor eight mimic, a new novel non-factor therapy. If they decide to switch to emicizumab, will it rid the inhibitor or could the inhibitor really come back years later? And how would they treat bleeds if they were using emicizumab prophylactically? So the guidance here are illustrated in a table. For hemophilia A patients with inhibitors, factor eight, plasma drive factor eight, or recombinant factor eight FC can be used with about 70% success. Recombinant factor eight dosing is around 200 units per kilogram daily. Success is defined as a persistently negative titer, <clears throat> recovery over 66% and a half-life of greater than six hours. Failure is defined as ITI that has not been achieved within two to three years. For hemophilia B with inhibitors, few data exist on ITI so the WFH really made no specific recommendations other than to use high dose treatment as in hemophilia A and consider immunosuppression. Again, success is uh, a persistently negative titer and failure is uh, very importantly uh, linked potentially to allergic reactions and nephrotic syndrome. And so factor nine is a problem in this setting. Now, what is the general guidance for immune tolerance induction? Currently, the WFH recommends that all inhibitor patients should undergo a trial of ITI. And it should be noted that data on the impact of extended half-life products in ITI is really limited. After successful ITI, factor VIII prophylaxis should be initiated. Non-factor therapies may reduce disease burden, but their use in ITI is not yet established. So immune tolerance induction, what do we do in treating patients who are ITI refractory, that is they didn't respond to ITI, or they're ITI naive, that is they've not yet tried ITI. Current recommendations are that emicizumab prophylaxis is recommended over factor 7A. And we're gonna be talking in a moment about the fact that emicizumab is more effective and less invasive in terms of treatment. How should bleeds be man managed in ITI? In high responding inhibitors, 7A or APCC bypass would be used. If the titer is low, factor eight is advised. And it should be noted that APCC should be avoided in anyone taking emicizumab prophylaxis to avoid microangiopathy, which is clotting, thrombotic microangiopathy, TMA. So now let's look at the specific 
recommendations. The first one shows that emicizumab prophylaxis is recommended for persistent inhibitors. So in patients with HEMA with persistent inhibitors who fail ITI or never underwent ITI, WFH recommends emicizumab prophylaxis over bypass agent prophylaxis because emicizumab is more effective in bleed prevention and simpler to administer because it is given weekly and subcutaneously. The second recommendation pertains to hemophilia B and inhibitors. And it is recognized that ITI and hemophilia B data is limited. For patients with hemophilia B and inhibitors, WFH is unable to make a recommendation on the use of ITI as experience is limited. In patients with HEMA and inhibitors in whom ITI is attempted, high dose factor replacement protocol should be followed similar to what is recommended for HEMA with the strong consideration for the use of immunosuppression. It should be noted the risk of nephrotic syndrome as well as allergic reaction may increase with high dose ITI. So let's look at the recommendations for bleed management and emicizumab. So in hemophilia A patients who have inhibitors and who are taking emicizumab prophylaxis for bleed management, 7A is preferred over activated PCCs due to the thrombotic microangiopathy risk. So thrombotic microangiopathy has been reported in patients receiving APCCs and emicizumab together. Close monitoring is recommended in those who have thrombosis risk factors, such as a past thromboembolism, obesity, smoking, chronic infection, and inflammation. And close monitoring should also be followed for those receiving 7A who are at these risks or in whom risk may appear low. Let's look at the guidance for bleed management and emicizumab. The first guideline recommends emicizumab prophylaxis for those with persistent inhibitors. So it reads, for patients with hemophilia A and inhibitors who have acute bleeds, WFH recommends factor A concentrate with those with low responding inhibitors and bypass agents for those with uh, high responding inhibitors. So the bypass includes either 7A or APCC. In patients receiving emicizumab who receive factor VIII concentrate, WFH also recommends bovine reagent chromogenic factor VIII assays. This means the bovine factor X in the kit reagent to measure factor VIII-C and inhibitor titer levels because emicizumab interferes with standard assays. The next recommendation is about hemophilia A and high responding inhibitors who receive emicizumab. In such patients who develop an acute bleed, WFH prefers 7-8 over APCCs to avoid the risk of thrombotic microangiopathy. Now let's go to clinical case three. The child's maternal uncle is a 43-year-old man with severe hemophilia A and past inhibitor at 5.7 Bethesda units. He was begun on ITI two years ago after his inhibitor detection, but it was refractory to ITI. That is, it did not respond. So he still has an inhibitor and he's been taking recombinant factor 7A for bleeds. Now he has painful arthritis in his right ankle and the surgeon is recommending ankle fusion surgery. Lab studies reveal a current anti-8 of 4.5 Bethesda units. He says his nephew recently started weekly emicizumab and he wonders if he could also switch to emicizumab, but he has a few questions. Can he switch to emicizumab or should he wait until after surgery? And once he switches, can he still take 7A to treat his bleeds? What do the recommendations say? You can see here in this table what the recommendations are. But first you determine factor coverage, bypass and follow up, or use adjusted dose continuous infusion. And once hemostasis is achieved, 
a regimen of maintenance for three to five days can be given and tapered over the next one to three weeks. For those with high responding inhibitors, single agent 7A or APCC should be considered. If it fails, sequential bypass can be used, but uh, a great deal of monitoring should be done to assure no risk for thrombosis, either precedes its use or occurs during its use. We'll talk about that in a minute. For low responding inhibitors, higher, more frequent doses or adjusted doses of standard factor may be used. So now let's look at the guidance for surgery and invasive procedures. What you're going to see on the top 8.3.10 is low responding factor eight inhibitors. And here what we're seeing is those with low responding factor eight inhibitors in hemophilia A who undergo surgery or an invasive procedure, the WFH suggests higher, more frequent factor eight product dosing than the usual dose to the short half-life. And this is due to the short half-life of factor eight in such patients. What about patients with high responding inhibitors? For patients with hemophilia A and high responding inhibitors who undergo surgery or invasive procedures, WFH recommends bypass agent therapy with 7A or APCC at the discretion of the treating clinician. If single agent bypass fails, sequential bypass agent treatment is another approach. This is where 7A is alternated with APCC for a potentially better therapeutic approach. But the WFH also recommends very close monitoring for thrombosis and actually recognizing what potential risk a patient may have for thrombosis as mentioned before. So now let's look at the general recommendations for surgery and invasive procedures. Again, one determines factor coverage, bypass and follow-up or uses adjusted dose continuous infusion. For high responding inhibitors, 7A is preferred over APCCs in those who are taking emicizumab prophylaxis. Whereas those with low responding inhibitors, factor eight products are advised for surgery. And once hemostasis is achieved, one can maintain the regimen for three to five days and taper over the next one to three weeks. What do the recommendations say? For those with heme who are receiving emicizumab prophylaxis who undergo major surgery invasive procedure, WFH recommends a factor eight containing product for those with low responding inhibitors. For those with high responding inhibitors, the WFH prefers 7A over APCC due to the risk of thrombotic microangiopathy. The WFH makes no recommendation on specific dose frequency or duration as there are insufficient data. The remark is important. Caution is urged when 7A is used in patients receiving emicizumab prophylaxis who have risk factors for thrombosis. And those are specifically past venous thromboembolism, obesity, smoking, chronic infection, inflammation due to the risk of an acute uh, heart attack, which we call a non-STEMI myocardial infarction or pulmonary embolism. The second recommendation is for those with hemophilia B. For patients with hemophilia B and factor IX inhibitors who undergo surgery, the WFH recommends 7A over APCC as APCC contains factor IX and may cause or worsen an allergic reaction. So in summary, all inhibitor patients should undergo a trial of ITI. Data on the impact of extended half-life products on ITR are limited. After successful ITI, factor VIII prophylaxis should be initiated. For hemostasis in surgery in inhibitor patients on emicizumab, 7A should be used. Bleeds that occur while a patient is on emicizumab should be managed with 7A. Non-factor therapy prophylaxis may reduce disease burden, but its use in ITI is not established. So I would like to thank the Hemophilia Alliance for their support in developing this presentation.